have started the recording. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am so glad to see you this morning, and it's uh, it's always such a joy to be here. One of the things I was realizing as I had this privilege of preparing the service was that I knew what some of the songs were going to be singing, so I've been singing them in my head, but I've also been singing the one where we couldn't find the music for, it. and that one you're not singing, but I still am, just so you know. <laughs> Not only you are, I've been singing it too in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Angela, are you singing it in your head as well? Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just needed the music and we couldn't find it. So I, I welcome you this day to this place of gathering. And um, I was thinking, as I do, about this, this wonderful building that we're in and how it's a place where we know our ancestors have been, our ancestors in faith, have been sitting in here, gathering in this place, and the history of the building, and the people who committed enough to their faith to want to have a structure for people to gather. And I think about the people on whose land we're living and worshiping, and I'm thinking too about um, the generosity and welcoming aspect of them are their beings to allow us to be here this day. And I give thanks for the people, the Sonic peoples and the Coast Salish, but in particular the Sonic people who have shared their land with us. And I think of what this really means for us as we enter the spirit and accompany, grow to the spirit of reconciliation. That part of us in honoring who we are, where we are, also means some very heavy work in acknowledging um, the cultural disasters that happened from early settlers and the government policies and what continues to happen and how we need to work towards reconciliation. And I think we've got a wonderful, our elected officials have made a wonderful decision in electing Carmen Lansdowne as our new moderator, Reverend Dr. Carmen Lansdowne. And um, I hope with her leadership that we can continue to grow and take direction, not just as our own congregation, but as the broader church. We have a lot of work to do. And, uh, and yet we move forward with gratitude that we can and that we have that commitment and that knowledge. So I wonder, are there any celebrations or announcements Bill and Nancy are whispering up here. Are there any celebrations or announcements? No. <laughs> no? I have my legal anniversary coming up. You have your legal anniversary coming up? My legal wedding anniversary. Your legal wedding anniversary coming up. Saturday. On when? Saturday. On Saturday. So we should sing happy anniversary, right? It's made of a stretch, Angie. I don't know if she knows the oh, anniversary it's song. It's I don't know which two of you are using. Well, we can do it any, can't we? Sure, we can. They, they can do it. Some of these people just know it, so happy, that's fine. Uh, happy anniversary. Yeah. Happy anniversary, anniversary, anniversary. Happy anniversary, anniversary to you. You've been together forever, the weather. So happy anniversary, and God bless you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank we you have a birthday in our in a way, my son's partner, and I know her 50th birthday today. Okay, Bill. That's worthy. 
because yeah. she's connected to you, and you like to sing these things. <laughs> so we'll do it. <laughs> okay. Happy birthday. Happy birthday.
Once there was someone who said such wonderful things and did such amazing things that people followed him. And then someone got the courage up to say, who are you? And he said, I am the light. Jesus brought God's light into the world not to hold within himself, but to share. And through each generation, this light has been passed along, that we may light, live Christ's light in the world this day. And may it be so. This singing bowl is a way of offering us to the opportunity to go into the quiet, into the quiet of where God rests in our heart, who lives in our heart, but also being aware of God's presence going out into the world, way beyond anything we can hear or understand. still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. We sit in your presence, Holy One, hearts open, grateful to be here at this time, in this space, together. May this be a time for deepening our relationship with you through scripture, word, and song. May we continue to grow as a community of faith, working to make your world a better place for all. Amen.
guess he'd be able to come forward for the reading. Today's reading is from John chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. The writer of John suggests a chronological order of miracles, beginning with the changing of water into wine, considered Jesus' first miracle, and in chapter 5, the healing of the sick man on the Sabbath in Jerusalem. When asked, the man who was healed was unable to identify Jesus, but once the Jewish leaders were able to determine who it was, they challenged Jesus for working on the Sabbath <coughs> and questioned his authority to heal. So it's one of these teaching moments offered by Jesus to ears that weren't ready to hear, nor hearts that weren't ready to recognize on whose authority he was able to do this. They felt threatened and wanted to kill him. He left, and as the reading states, went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and here his popularity became obvious. Feeding the 5,000. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of the type of disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is coming into our world. The prophet who is coming into the world, then Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Jesus walks on water. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to talk, take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. Hear what the Spirit, Spirit is saying to the, the church. church. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
Thank you, Bill and Nancy, for your reading of scripture. And as I hear those words again, <laughs> it's, it, these stories in the Bible, they just sort of keep opening up more and more ideas. And uh, it's, it's just a pleasure to be able to sit and listen. And thank you, Angela, for your music. It just, it certainly deepened my awareness of what's in my heart at this time. So thank you very much for that. Everyday miracles. Now, one of the privileges I have as someone who's called in to do what we call pulpit supply in this church is uh, pick out the scriptures and the stories that I really enjoy. And as I said, this one, I just keep, it's just like peeling an onion back for all the, the, the deepness of the learnings in it. But these two miracle stories really have stayed with me from childhood. Imagine a child coming forward to share what food the child had. Walking on water. I suspect I was not the only child, certainly growing up on the prairies, who took advantage of ice on the frozen pond and to imagine having the, the power to follow Jesus walking on water. This man who did these marvelous things, I could follow in his footsteps mm -hmm. if there was ice. <laughs> For me, Jesus was like a superman, able to do the impossible to make the world a better place. The writers of the four gospels take different perspectives as to what is important to record about the life of Jesus. They are different, and yet all four Gospels include the feeding narrative. Only the writer of Luke excludes the walking on water. The writers of Matthew, Mark, and John couple both miracles. One can certainly assume there was intention on the part of each writer to do so. The writer of John appears to use miracle narratives as a way to unveil key knowledge of Jesus' divine character and purpose. Our contemporary minds tend to want to demystify and perhaps even discredit anything resembling a miracle. I was reading different theologians' interpretations of this reading. What I appreciate so much is that not all appear to understand it and thus explain it through the same lens. What they each lift up differs. They contribute to my curiosity as to how I might understand the narrative in today's world. There are many different ways to consider these narratives. Certainly there is the very literal understanding that because Jesus is the Son of God, he was able to make the loaves and fish miraculously multiply. Or a more contemporary explanation is that people were shamed into sharing what they, had become, what they had because of the generosity of a small child. Or maybe it really isn't about food or even the ability to walk on water, but more about a longing of the people for a savior, a worldly king with power to take down the occupying forces. Jesus personified hope for a different way of being for people who lived under occupation. From their perspective, they desire change to their physical world, and when oppressed, it can be difficult to see any other way other than through a physical revolt. How can love be superior to that? How can love conquer? Some believe they follow Jesus because he performed miracles. But Jesus brought hope and healing to hundreds of needy people. They followed him. They believed he was capable of miracles. He spoke of God's love. This message of love, of God loving them, the marginalized, the oppressed, the disenfranchised, was so different from how they were treated by those in power. The second miracle may not be so much about that Jesus was thought to have walked on water, but rather his presence among ordinary, insecure, and timid persons could calm their anxieties and cause them to walk where before it was impossible. 
where they feared to go. So feeding the mob of people. In our lives, maybe it's feeding unexpected guests or suddenly realizing how many people showed up. For her, perhaps our response to feeding any unexpectedly large gathering would be more like the disciples. When asked how to feed the crowd, we might respond like Philip and quickly calculate the cost, six months wages, and even then people would only get a little. And I would take a step further to wonder, where on earth can I possibly buy that amount of food when we're on a mountain away from urban stores? We might be like Andrew and go out to assess the crowd. What are their needs? Does anyone have a surplus? Is there a stash of energy bars anywhere? He comes back to Jesus, and I interpret it as being a small child. It says a boy, but you know. A small child who is willing to offer what is considered traveling food of the very poor, barley loaves and fish, probably dried fish. I like to imagine that moment. A child, a courageous child, a generous child, a trusting child, coming forward, unburdened by judgment that this food is too meager, not good enough. A child, not an adult. A child who assumes abundance. An adult could easily assume what they have is not enough. Hardly enough for them, therefore not enough to share. Or perhaps judge, no one else would even like this. Or, I'll watch and I'll wait, and I'll see if anyone else offers first. There are so many reasons mature minds can find excuses. And imagine, Jesus taking this food, no doubt with loving respect, for the one sharing it, asks that people be seated, blessing the food, and then distributing it to all who are gathered. And what is implied is that there is enough for all who are gathered. They get their fill, and still the disciples are able to gather up the fragments to fill 12 baskets. Nothing is to be wasted. Yet, it was a child who assumed abundance and fully understood abundance. I think of the act of a child coming forth with a small amount of food, of trusting that what he, she has will be enough to help others. I think of Jesus trusting in that moment that it will be enough and asking God's blessing. We can understand the story both as one about abundance and also perception of what abundance is. Who are we, and in this case, who am I, to judge someone else's sense of abundance? And yet I do judge. I judge from my place of privilege. Yet it is also my privilege that has allowed me to be in relationship with others who from our worldview lack privilege lack economic necessities. Fifty years ago, I was in Guyana, South America. I was a volunteer with the Canadian-based international organization. And along with a small number of other foreigners, I was invited to the home of a family of sugar plantation workers to share a meal. The food was plentiful and so tasty. I still marvel at the work involved to prepare such a feast and the cost, aware of their economic poverty. Yet at the time, what I remember is their warm hospitality. I didn't yet have the world experience to understand how little they would have to eat in the upcoming days because of their generosity. Another time, several years later, 
I was visiting a squatter community in Cambodia with the Khmer staff person from an organization working in the community. Squatters are people often with no rights, no security, and little money. Yet I saw their understanding of abundance. There was a sheet of plastic attached to one of the squatter homes. Cardboard and a blanket was on the ground underneath. <coughs> they were providing shelter for a woman and her children who were surviving on what she could earn picking weeds. Now these weeds had nutrition and she was selling them in the market <coughs> to in turn buy rice for her family. <coughs> It was there where I met people really living hand to mouth, yet they were able to live with abundance and support each other when I only saw scarcity. Both these situations, and there have been so many more, <laughs> I have so much to learn, have contributed to my ongoing learning to reassess abundance in our own lives, to see the possibility of positive change for all. We are challenged to deal with the media's focus on disasters around the world, from wildfires consuming forests and homes, to wars like in Ukraine, to mass murders, and to overthrowing governments. We wonder how we can respond to global issues like climate change, and when so many of these issues seem beyond our control, even beyond our own government's control. Yet we also know that even in these very chaotic times, miracles happen. People do act, do speak up, do affect change. God's <coughs> love, relational, deeply passionate, flows. Like this narrative of the loaves and fishes, when love empowers, there is more than enough. Does it really matter whether it was loaves and fishes, or whether the meaning was so much more? There are people in our time who have recognized a great need and step out in faith, trusting with God's help they can make a difference. They do so when others who view the world differently, perhaps from an economic perspective, believe it's impossible, unrealistic, too great a risk, even crazy. So instead of barriers, there are people who seek who see a crack of possibility, maybe <coughs> a step, or in some cases, a leap. So I'm wondering, I love getting stories from people in the, in the seats here. Do you, can you think of any people or situations that come to mind where the situations may maybe seem impossible, and yet somebody has stepped forward into it to change it? Desegregation. Yeah. Yeah. The people that stood up to that and <coughs> changed. Yeah. And changed the world. And changed the world. Yeah. And we continue to work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for sure. It's a work in progress. But it's yeah. a work in progress. Yes, but what yes. What was done in the 60s. Yeah. What was done in the, in the 60s. Yeah. Very important work. Thank you, Angela. And, and just sort of a segue. So apartheid in South <coughs> Africa, when, when that rose up and, uh, and rather peacefully, but what a huge change that's made. And it's still a work in progress. I mean, often these things, it's a beginning, but it's a beginning that inspires us. I was thinking of just something locally, uh, where the um, Central Sandwich Community Garden was an idea get started and uh, they just asked for volunteers and there was a man who would dig, there was a man who would build, there, you know, people volunteered their time and 
and I was over, over there, and you should have seen the happy faces of the gardeners in there showing off their plants and things. It was so needed for the community, and people <coughs> stepped forward with volunteering to help. Yeah, so he, yeah, the local idea of a, of a, a garden of coming together, <coughs> and, and what's happening? It's, it's the gardens being created, but what else is happening? Oh, yes, yes, you could see in their faces, the community came together, yeah. and, um, and they have an outlet for their imagination, their love, and they've got other people with them as a community, yeah. which is nice. So they're building community as well yes. as a community garden. Yes. Yeah, yes. thank you, Helen. Yeah. Yeah, some of these things are, are big, and yet miracles happen everywhere. And I think when we shift our perception as to what is a miracle and what's possible, we start noticing. We start noticing. We start noticing the thing like, the sun came up this morning. Or isn't that a beautiful sunset? And we get listening to a bird, a bird singing. And you know, I wonder, where does that bird come from? Where is that bird's home? Where did the bird learn that song? So there's all kinds of ways when we think about miracles of things that happen. And certainly around the protection of the earth, we know that there's people who are taking great steps to make people aware of change, of the change in their lives in the Amazon with the development, the change of lives of people here in Canada through deforestation. And we need to continue to be doing that. So when we are overwhelmed by need and paralysis settles in, it, can, it really can be difficult to believe anything we do will make a difference. But we begin. And we begin where we are. We can notice those everyday miracles. We can pay attention to the music of life. We can respond to the smile of a stranger. We can do random acts of kindness. We can acknowledge a child, a person on the street. We can be the miracle in someone else's life. We can do as Jesus did. Acknowledge those on the margins. When people wanted to take him by force to make him king, he went away to the mountain by himself. He didn't seek adoration. He was doing God's work, and it was God who empowered him. We too may need to take time away to open ourselves to God and to see miracles, and to see the potential for miracles. Our relationships with others and our actions can be God-centered, not for personal re recognition. We can accompany people through their dark times, empower them to move through their anxieties and fear. We hear of people who act to save others. They don't consider themselves heroes. They acted because that is what they believed they should do and could do. Why do they put themselves at risk? What gives them the, pr the presence of mind to be very present to the moment of need? Sometimes what they're doing is even just holding someone's hand, reminding them that they are not alone. As a society, we're not comfortable talking about faith. Perhaps we fear being perceived as one of those Christians, trying to convert others to a belief system that judges non-believers harshly. Yet as a person of faith, I do believe God is present in the world in mysterious and miraculous ways. I do believe in miracles. It's up to me to notice them. It's up to me to acknowledge God's presence in my life. It's up to me to notice God working through others. It's also up to me to say, thank you, God.
let's sing a song that reminds us about the joys and miracles of everyday life. Morning is broken, voices united, 409. <laughs> So let's just think about ourselves and what it is that we give and honor ourselves for being able to do so and being willing to do so. I invite us to stand and sing, What Can I Do? Ward Voices 191. Sing 
Lord, listen to your children praying. Voices United 400. <laughs> invite us into a time of communal prayer. You may wish to hold your prayers or thoughts silently in your heart, but you are also welcome to share them aloud. As in doing so, it offers us in community to hold you in our prayers as well as those for whom you're praying. If praying for a person Please respect confidentiality. Do not use any identifying name or relationship. It's not needed, for God knows. We keep in mind the words of Henry Nolan. It is the mystery that the heart, which is the center of our being, is transformed by God into God's own heart, a heart large enough to embrace the entire universe. she's come into this position in the spirit that is led by the divine. I pray for the people of Ukraine and I pray for the people of Russia, for people who are caught in conflict, not necessarily of their own making. for people we know and people in the broader community who are going through chemotherapy and taking other paths of healing with the hope that a miracle does happen and they in turn are healed. I pray for researchers who are wanting, desiring to find the causes of viruses and other things that impact our lives. May they be supported with courage and wisdom.
yeah, prayers for the work being done within the in the Catholic Church towards reconciliation. And the Pope's visit. And may that visit not be overshadowed, overshadowed by the presence of the Pope, but rather by the message the Pope brings. The people of Afghanistan. Our friends and neighbors who have reached their stage of the life when they're called elsewhere. Yeah, for our friends and neighbors who have been called elsewhere. We live with the knowing that life as we know it becomes something else. The people and animals who are devastated by the fires and the floods. Prayers for responders, nurses and doctors, all of those who are working such long hours and under great pressure. And may they be given the strength to do the work that they're called to do. But I also pray that there's times when they can relax, and feel renewed and know that they don't have to be the, the saints 24 7 that they often are I give thanks for grandchildren and I give thanks for the technology that brings them to us FaceTime, Zoom. As in being patient. <laughs> yep, prayers for patience, that we may have patience to deal with we, to, to deal with life, to live. <laughs> I pray for laughter, and I give thanks for laughter such a joy to hear that and to lighten our spirits. I pray for those friends and colleagues that um, are now traveling uh, during the summer to see friends and, and keep them safe and keep them patient as they travel. Mm -hmm. For people who are traveling and may they be safe and I would add May, in the traveling, their perceptions be altered, to see things that are different, to see possibility, and to live life fully. And I definitely give thanks for living where I live. I feel so privileged. Amen. To these prayers, I add living water. Water is essential to life. It's one of the gifts the Creator has given us. It's one of the gifts that helps remind us that in our lives, we celebrate even as we grieve that the two come together and the range of feelings and experiences in between. 
may we hold the awareness of what prayer can do within ourselves and with others. May we find guidance as we journey through life, the joys and also the trials. May we be ever mindful of the beauty and blessings in our lives. May we ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ, our companion and guide, praying as he taught us. Our Father, our, Father, our Mother, our Mother who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy, thy, come. thy will be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 